Hello, pleasant good night, and thank you once again for joining in to HealthWise by the St. Kitts, Nevis Medical and Dental Association. I'm your host as usual, Dr. Woody. We use this platform to motivate you, our listening audience, to improve and to maintain good health. We do this through the discussions, as our HealthWise family know, of various issues, sicknesses, we discuss the trends and patterns of diseases, etc. We believe that education is the pillar of preventative medicine and it helps you, the listening audience, to make informed, healthier decisions about your lives. As usual, we use this platform also to showcase our medical team of hard workers who sometimes go unnoticed. These workers may be doctors, nurses, and in the near future, we will have our EMTs and other allied health care workers. However, tonight is a bit different. As you know, in health, there are stakeholders, and they are commonly known as the four Peace, patients, providers like myself and Nurse Blois, who is here. We have payers and we have policy makers. The latter two most times go unnoticed. And that is why tonight we have decided to pay special attention to the payers and the policy makers because we need everyone involved to keep the health system going. So we have brought on board a friend, a island that has been a stakeholder for many years. And we are going to look at the history of this island, Taiwan, the Republic of China, Taiwan, who has helped us over 40 years wow. as it relates to agriculture, which is closely or intimately involved with health care. So tonight with us, I have Ambassador Michael Lin from the Embassy of China, Taiwan. I also have William, William Chen, Project Manager. I have with me currently Sister Nurse Keisha Rollins, CEO of Care Nursing Agency, who is a recipient of such help. And later, we will be joined by Dr. Wolan, a general practitioner who studied in Taiwan. Pleasant good night to all, and thank you for spending your Monday night with us here on HealthWise. So I'm going to have the ambassador, Michael Lin, from the Embassy of China, Taiwan, to introduce himself briefly. Then we are going to move to William Chen to introduce himself and Sister Keisha Rollins, who is no stranger to the media here in St. Kitts, she will reintroduce herself to the public, and then we will get into our topic tonight. So Ambassador Lin, I thank you so much for being here, and can you say a few words to our listening and viewing audience? Um, a very pleasant good evening to everyone who is watching us on the TV or online through YouTube. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to participate in this uh, program today. Um, uh, I just came here in 2018 as a counselor of the embassy, then in 2021 assumed the post of the ambassador. So this would be my 
actually six years in St. Kitts and Nevis, and the, uh, it's already been a home, a, a work from home for me, and I'm very like to uh, share some of my experience and my expertise here tonight with you, and I hope that we could have a very informative night with Dr. Uh, Woodley. Thank you. Okay, and then we have William Chen, who will introduce himself. William? Hi, um, good evening everybody um, to the audience online and um, I'm, t I'm in front of TV. My name is William Chen. I'm the project manager of metabolic chronic disease and of course later we're going to dive right into more about the project. And we have nurse Keisha Walling, CEO of Care Nursing Agency. Hi, good night everyone. I'm Keisha Walling, CEO of Care Nursing Agency and we are in home provider and we are also humanitarian in some of our activities. So I'm happy to be here among the panelists tonight, sharing in my experience from the Taiwanese Embassy. Okay, thank you so much panelists for introducing yourself to our audience. Um, like anything, we always like to give some perspective in terms of geography of the island that is helping us. So Ambassador Michael Lin, he would now give us a little history, because I do believe history is important. We always have to understand what took place in the past, because it helps us to understand what is happening currently and what will happen in the future. So Ambassador Lin, can you give a brief rundown of where you are situated, what or how this relationship came about, and from there we will just take it. Okay, uh, actually Taiwan is located in the Northeast Asia. Um, mm -hmm. So in the north is Japan and the south is Philippines and to the uh, east is China, mainland China. Taiwan the, with a landscape of 36, 5,000 square kilometers with a population of 23 million people. And uh, we established the diplomatic relations with St. Kitts and Nevis in 1983. And actually, two years before the relationship established, so we can see on the on the screen is the picture that Sir Kennedy Seaman signed a diplomatic uh, communique with uh, the time uh, Prime Minister, uh, Premier of Taiwan, uh, to officially establish our diplomatic ties in 1983 October. So we can see in the picture that they are signed a joint communique in 1983. Okay, this was very interesting because while we were doing our research, we came across this photo. And I really want to thank the person who would have shared this photo online and placed it online. Um, I didn't get a name, so I would like to give, um, you know, thank you for the photo that was shared. Because history is important and we cannot rewrite or retell history. And this photo means a lot to us here in the Federation, and we can see where the relationship extended all the way back to 1983. And what we can see that this was right on the heels of our independence. Yes. And what Ambassador um, Michael Lin has said, even prior to 1983, in 1980 or 81. 1981. Yes, we would have established relationship with the Republic of China, Taiwan. And this is really amazing because some persons may think that this relationship would have started. just started, would have just come into being. But as we can see, it's almost, it's over for 40 years. Actually, in 1981, our technical mission already came into St. Kitts and Nevis to start their project here. The first uh, project, as I could recall, was the uh, land rice project. Our uh, agriculture experts actually came in here to teach the local farmers to grow land rice in St. Kitts and Nevis. So uh, we started the relations before the independence, independence. Then gradually we officially established in the uh, uh, the political highs in 1983 after uh, St. Kitts and Nevis gained its independence. Mm -hmm. So the uh, relationship actually could trace back more than 40 years. Mm -hmm. although, we, uh, although we celebrate the 40th anniversary this year, uh, that's because we signed a diplomatic uh, communicate on that, on that year in 1983 after your independence. Okay. And then there's another 
photo on the screen, another slide there, and Ambassador Michael was actually going through the photo and picking out some of the Taiwanese that are there. And he said, by now, they are retired, just like our Prime Minister, the yes. Right Honorable, the former Prime Minister, the Right Honorable um, Kennedy Simmons, who's in that photo as well. So if somebody can actually um, WhatsApp me or text me and let me know who shared those photos, so I can actually thank you over you know, this medium, I would greatly appreciate that. So these photos are priceless. Um, they are great. And this would have been at, in which building you think in Taiwan? Actually, this is uh, in the Prime Minister's office, Premier's office. Mm -hmm. um, in our system, the Premier equivalent to your Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. He's the head of the government. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, uh, Sir Kennedy Seaman, uh, he, uh, he was receiving Sir Kennedy Seaman at that time because they are on the same position as head of government. Okay. So the envoy to sing it, the, the Taiwanese presence here in our country, I know it has divisions. We have the diplomatic division, and then we also have what is known as the technical mission in St. Kitts and Nevis. So William, so yes, there we have it on the screen. So we see exactly the functioning of how we actually understand now the relationship between St. Kitts and Nevis and the Taiwan embassy. So we have the diplomatic mission, and then we have the technical mission in St. Kitts and Nevis. And both of them, in what I have understood, they have different functions. Yeah. Basically, the, our embassy works as the of government, uh, official representative of my government to St. Kitts and Nevis. So basically, we will work with the government agencies, mainly the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is our focal point. Then through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we also have the other contact with different government agencies and the mm -hmm. department and ministries. However, our mission, they are mostly focused on the uh, cooperation projects that implemented here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, range from uh, agriculture projects, public health, uh, ICT, education, um, the uh, recycling, uh, solid waste management and recycling projects. So that basically they are more uh, like the experts or professionals who are on certain discipline and the projects. Not like our, we are career diplomats, mm -hmm. but career diplomats, we are civil servants. Mm -hmm. So they are more likely uh, with the technicians or with experts, expertise, professionals, personnel. Uh, we are civil servants, so our role is a little bit different from there. But however, we are working here in St. Kitts as a team. As a team, so we coordinate with each other and uh, to implement all the cooperation project here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Okay, that's great. So now we're going to invite um, William Cheng mm -hmm. to speak about the technical mission because this is the crux of the matter. Mm -hmm. I guess persons are waiting to see well, okay, where you know the contribution comes in as it relates to health. So William, you're going to explain to us the technical mission in St. Kitts as it relates to health and how this mission actually helps our health system. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, how about let me introduce Taiwan SDA first. So I think that all the audience are, are very familiar with Taiwan SDF mm -hmm. because uh, you might receive a scholarship and you might um, receive any um, assistance from any project of, uh, on this island. And Taiwan SDF did it's the full name of Taiwan SDF is Taiwan International Cooperation and Development Fund. And Taiwan SDF, we have several, um, I think it's four uh, focuses. We have investing, uh, we have lending and investment, and we have um, cooper a cooperative assistance, and we also have hum uh, humanitarian um, assistance, and we also have international um, education and training. Yeah, and so through this, uh, through this uh, numerous project in different countries, at, and ICDF is the, um, you can say the first and also the official uh, foreign aid agency in Taiwan. And from the cooperative assistance side, we, um, the fund actually received from, um, sponsored by our Ministry of, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So that's why, that's why um, Ambassador said that here we work as a team to implement projects. Okay, so the 
projects that are undertaken here mm -hmm. as it relates to health, it comes from the ICDF yes. fund. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So exactly what are some of these projects you would have undertaken as it relates to health? So here, the only, um, only project related to health is my project. Uh, it calls, the full name is the capacity, be, uh, capacity Building Project for the Prevention and Control of uh, Metabolic Chronic Disease. But I abbreviate, uh, I usually abbreviate because it's too, too long, so I usually call it Metabolic Chronic Disease Projects. Yeah, okay. and th this project we usual uh, we we cooperate with the Ministry of Health, of course. So we uh, we assist uh, the Ministry of Health to implement, for example, um, health screenings. We help the Ministry of Health uh, um, design uh, educational flyers, and we help them uh, in numerous aspects. Later, we will go through a little bit. It, uh, yeah. Okay, so what I'm gathering, so these are like the project introduction. Mm -hmm. So that project you just spoke about, which is the capacity building project mm -hmm. for the prevention and control of metabolic chronic diseases. And as we all know, that is something that is plaguing us here on, in St. Kitts and Nevis and throughout the region and throughout the world. So this project is actually something very important. Many times I see the Taiwanese in town, in the square, on diff in different areas, doing a lot of different blood pressures, doing um, sugar testing, and I did not realize that it was something so structured and that mm -hmm. this project was in place. Um, I'm going to have Nurse Blois, Sister Rollins, come in now before you continue, um, William. And I want her to give us a brief you know synopsis of how she would have benefited from this project especially given the fact that she's the ceo of a health care agency in the federation so sister Rollins, can you give us a brief you know rundown of your experience with this project the capacity building project, project for the prevention and control of metabolic chronic diseases when um, the project manager, Mr. William Chen, and the coordinator, Ms. Novelia Wusu, engaged me and my team, mainly we had the same aims for the Federation. We wanted to have, wanted to be of an assistance to the public and Federation by extension. We wanted to make sure we utilize our human resources and to build and boost the socio-economic development of the country and we first had to know what's happening so this project became important because we wanted to see what's happening in St. Kitts in terms of diabetes, hypertension and kidney failure. These diseases are plaguing the Federation, the Caribbean on a whole and so care nursing agency because we do care and we want to be a part of anything that is moving and changing and growing we wanted to jump on board right away to assist the the project because I thought it was a very important project for our federation. So when, the, when Mr. Chen and Wusu, who is Ministry of Health and the Taiwanese came, we decided to do whatever we can. So we hosted a lot of events and sometimes we intentionally hosted events so that we can get people to come and gravitate because it would have been a new concept for the island. You usually see these blood pressure taken and screening done when it's a, like a special occasion, but we wanted to make it more public and so that we could have a widespread and that, you know, through education, of course, people would jump on board and want to take part in their own activity, their own health activity. So it was a way of sensitizing the public, I think, to, you know, being responsible and for getting checked. So persons would know, okay, they're gonna, we're going to be here, or we're going to be there. And sometimes the best way to do that is have an event. And persons are curious, so they come to the event. And that's when we grab hold of them and say, come on, and give them a little education along the way. So it was a, it was a way to get people on board and sensitize the public for what is to come, as this project should have lasted a bit, like up to four years. So with the public knowing and seeing the faces, they would now say, okay, these are the people who care and take care of us, so let us go and have our checks. And that's what we wanted for the Federation. And I am happy that you said that, um, Sister Wallins, because I guess now persons can put a face and a meaning to mm -hmm. what is happening. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when you don't know what is happening, 
you will just pass straight. Mm -hmm. I mean, once I see something in the square that is held, I sometimes just peek in and see what is going on. But if you understand the objective of what is happening, then you feel, you know, happier, you feel a little more less stressed to actually participate in what is going on. So I'm happy that you said that. So now, when you're passing through the square, or anywhere where you see, you know, healthcare workers, chances are this is the project that is being undertaken by the Taiwanese technical mission here in St. Gates. So Williams, as it comes to the project, just give us a little more details mm -hmm. as what is happening. Um, we're gonna have some slides where persons can see numbers because sometimes when people don't see numbers, they don't think that something is happening. So give us as it relates to the project introduction, and I see we have three steps, which is policy level, institutional level, and the community level. So we're gonna speak first on the policy level, exactly what does that entail? Okay, that's, um, let's go through the community level first, because uh, oh, okay. just like Nurse uh, Rollins, uh, Nurse Rollins say, uh, this health screening is about the community level. We screening a, on a large scale of the people here in St. Kitts and Nevis. And the, the purpose of this health screening is to educate people. They, uh, they well know their, their body conditions. And also we educate them uh, on diet and how to prevent or how to control their uh, chronic illness. That's for, uh, that's for the um, community level. And the institution level, it's about um, to to ed, um, to train the train the staff or mm -hmm. doc, like doctors and nurses in the institution like JNF Hospital or Alessandro Hospital, and uh, this part we cooperate with a hospital in Taiwan called Taipei Veteran General Hospital. We okay, um, William, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I think this is something very important mm -hmm. that back to the community level. Mm -hmm. which is slide number three. This is important because we would see all of these sessions that are taking place and between 2021, 20, yeah. 22, mm -hmm. we had nine sessions, okay? And then you see these are education sessions. Mm -hmm. We are educating yeah. because education is a tool to improve your health. Mm -hmm. So that is why we believe and that is why we are here on Monday nights to educate people, give you that that, that, that platform gives you that tool to make informed decisions that would help you to live longer, change your lifestyle, yep. so that you can have a you know, better lifestyle, so that you can have a longer life. I'm looking at the self-management workshop. Exactly what does this entail? So it's a CDSMP. It's chronic disease uh, self-management uh, workshop. So it's, uh, um, it's usually... Um, I mean, this workshop usually provided by our uh, senior educator, Vera France, mm -hmm. and also were accompanied by another educator, such as like, uh, our project coordinator, uh, Noviel Nunsu. Okay. Yeah. So this is a six-week um, workshop, and every week they will educate you different topic. For example, how to, uh, l how to focus on your, your food label, mm -hmm. and how to do a behavior change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So every week they will give you a small topic and also they will give you assignment to go through so you will do, you go back home with your homework and then just uh, do it and improve it with this sixth week and you will see a little bit improve and you continue okay so this is, this is very important so how can someone become part of these workshops because that is what the public would be asking how can i become part of this workshop, how can my institution, or how can you know, a workplace, for example, one of those workplaces downtown, how can they be a part of these workshops? Who, do, who would they have to speak to, to get on board? Uh, of course, as I mentioned, that uh, this project is covered with the Ministry of Health. So always contact Ministry of Health that say you have the needs, you have the, of course, uh, uh, it will be better if you, uh, you, if your organization or your church are interested, you can always contact the Ministry of Health. You can contact Dr. Kati, the, the coordinator of health, uh, health Promotion Unit, and we will arrange the rest of the, the, um, the workshop for you. Okay, so what I'm gathering here, if any place, any workplace, any organization, um, churches, if you need this type of assistance, 
and support as it relates to health, then we go through the Ministry of Health. Yes. And from there, then we get these things coordinated. I'm also looking at the educational material that was given, at least 30,000 um, hard copy. Mm -hmm. These things were given out to the Ministry of Health or to places in the community. Um, this, this flyer is that we after we um, kind of work with the Ministry of Health, and we usually distribute it during the health screening. Mm -hmm. But of course, we also have some stock that it's available in the Ministry of Health. So people, they can just come to the Ministry of Health and they get the information that you need. So this is really good again. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking, you know, when you have your pastors at church, you can go get some flyers and when you're giving out your leaflets at church, you can also give out something on hypertension, give yes. out something on, you know, renal, renal failure, give out something on high, um, diabetes. So what we are doing here tonight is letting you know where the information is, letting you know where you can access the material to take care of yourself, not just yourself, those persons as well around you. So this is very, very interesting at the community level. And I love how this program has just permeated the community. It has gone to such, you know, almost a basic level, which is what we need. Because sometimes when we do things in a grandiose fashion, we sometimes miss the little man yes. who would understand what is going on. So I really love how you got into the community. And if you go to slide 14, I didn't even know all of this was happening under that program. So can we get slide 14, please? So we have all of these health promotion activities. We have in your kitchen. I mean, that was something I was looking at. I mean, because I love that. And I didn't realize it came under this program. And then we have all of these virtual nutritional um, educational program. I mean, this is great. And uh, as the president of the association, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to see all of these things. And now I know there's another avenue that we can access to get help as it relates to health. So when we go now to the institutional level, as you were speaking, William, we're going to the institutional level, that's slide 12. Mm -hmm. so, um, so this institutional level, we which um, in order to strengthen the care uh, capacity of the metabolic chronic disease in the institution. So we provide uh, training courses here locally, and then we also um, send them back to Taipei Veteran General Hospital to be trained there. And they usually receive six weeks of training, and then they come back because it's a, we call it a train the, uh, train the trainer. So after they receive uh, training there in Taipei Veteran General Hospital, they come back here to train the others. They continue the training. Yeah. Okay. So, and I've seen between 2021, 2022, we have sent off quite a few persons. Yeah, because so all of these persons would have gone to yes. Taipei. Uh, and Taipei is in... Um, Taiwan. Yes. So that's where they would yes. have gone. Yes, yes. That's, uh, that's the Taipei Veteran General Hospital. Actually, uh, Prime Minister Dr. Zhu, when he visited Taiwan last November, they, uh, we arranged a meeting with them in the hospital. He visited the General, uh, Veteran General Hospital. I also met with the uh, Kitchen Division medical staff there uh, in the hospital and also have a chat with them to understand, to see what their uh, experience and what their feedback in the training courses there. And most of them actually, they came back as a seat instructors, so they could actually train more medical staff here in St. Kitts and Nevis to uh, get there what they know and technique and knowledge that they learn from Taiwan to come back here to help the uh, local staff to have more get more training professional training for them so that's the project that the purpose of the sending the medical staff to Taipei for training okay so I, I okay I get that so you s we send persons off to train with the intention that when they get back then they they train, train more person locally, yes. Which is, which, is, which is really good. And then we have the policy level. So those are one of the P's that we see um, in healthcare, the stakeholders of healthcare, which is, which is you know, the policy maker, which normally persons don't really have interest in. We just want to see everything going and functioning. We want to get to the hospital and have nurses and doctors who are well equipped. But we do not see that we have to build 
all of these human resources. And these are the things that are happening in the background that most persons don't see. So we are looking here now at the policy level. And can you go through that with us, um, William? Yeah. So this policy level is uh, in order to assist the Ministry of Health to, to form uh, integrated care strategies. So in order to, to do this, every year we do a lot of um, health screenings. So this is actually, it's the data. So data tell you the stories. So without the data, you cannot, it, you cannot form any strategies, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the things that we're going to do. So after we have this data, we're, gonna, we're going to analyze it and we're going to write an um, uh, integrated care strategy according to, like based on this data. Mm -hmm. For example, every time uh, when, uh, with, this, um, with, uh, with this data, you will see how, how much percent is, uh, your, um, is hypertension, how much percent is diabetes. So with this data, you, you can write uh, a proper proposal or strategies like how, how the Ministry of Health can deal with these chronic diseases. So this is what we call evidence-based medicine. Yes. So we need the data, yep. and that is an area that I think every institution, it doesn't matter where in the world you are, we can always use support and we need support in that area. Because as we know in the health system, sometimes you know, data collection can be difficult. And if we can get some help in that area, of course, we would gladly accept it. So as we realize this program, you know, the support is vital. And it not only provides funding, but it also gives us some strategic direction as it relates to the health system. So, Sister Rollins, I'm going to ask you, in terms of your clients, um, you know, what is the general feedback um, when they interact with our Taiwanese friends? The thing is, we had to be creative <coughs> in how we go about it because persons are hearing about diabetes and hypertension and renal disease all the time. So, what do you do to get them be interested and take a listening ear because we are hearing it all the time but like I would remind them and the team would remind them that you might just hear something today that you never heard before and it will stick with you and that will change your whole life mm -hmm. so I think sometimes being creative in how you get people to listen is key because the screenings are fine but you need people to have a lifestyle change too so when they hear something in a simpler form or in a different way that helps for persons to connect to the information. So our role as caregivers in the, in, in the agency was to make sure we make it creative so pers and fun. Fun is always a good thing, I think, because that way person can, you know, we get down to the levels of the different persons so that they, even the rest of man, the different people who would pass by, I would not do a health check. They'll have to be dying to get to a health doctor. So this is the opportunity for us to be creative and reach out in a creative way, a controlled environment, but still creative so that persons could feel comfortable listening because if they listen enough, mm -hmm. that one thing that stood out or stands out could change their whole life. Mm -hmm. So that is so important that being creative in how we get persons to listen. And, and you know, a thought came to me here while I'm here because we focus on everybody in the community as healthcare providers, but sometimes we forget ourselves in the process. So I'm even proposing that we have a screening because Nurses Week is right here. So why not a Nurses Day, William, if you, don't, if you guys are not too full, I know you're <laughs> full, but a Nurses Day, why not have a screening for the nurses and the healthcare team, the, the lab, the pharmacy, and that way we could have the healthcare team you know, be looked on. Because we are missed along the way. We are caring, we are the caregivers, but who cares for the caregiver? Mm -hmm. So William, if you're not too booked, maybe on the 12th on Friday, we're having celebrations at the hospital. So maybe the team can come. Sure, definitely. And do screening for the nurses. Mm -hmm. That's well, a good idea. well, William, um, sister, a good sister idea. Wallings has, you know, she has hijacked you. <laughs> 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 so she has put you on the spot right there and then. But Sister Wallings has made an important point. Eh? Sometimes as caregivers, we forget to take care of ourselves. Yes. And that is very, something very, very um, innovative, um, Sister Wallings, you have just come up with, that for nurses, nurses week, we screen our nurses and yes. see what's going on with them because sometimes we forget and when we do check up on ourselves, sometimes it is too late. Um, there is slide 18. Can I have slide 18 where we can see one of our nurses 
um, well-known nurse in our in our institution, um, Sister Sister Clavier, who was also a recipient of um, the training that was done in um, Taiwan in Taipei. Um, she told me she went there in 2015. She learned a lot. If you go online, you can check out check out the the article online where she explained her experience there and what she learned there and it was very fulfilling for her as well. I'm going to put up slide 19 now and then we are going to take a break because when we get back we're going to have our doctor, Dr. Jazel Wolan who studied in Taiwan just to come and speak briefly about her experience there as well. So on that note Let's just stick a pin and we'll be back shortly. As we know it, the sky and below it. Could I never have more wonder? Yeah, with life and all you see and the climate's changing. But hope is remaining. And we can't ignore the future. It depends on you and me. One chance, all that we got. It's a sore thought. I'll write a prescription and see the nurse regarding the MMR vaccine. I heard on social media that the COVID-19 vaccine came in a container with the MMR label on it. Measles, mums and rubella vaccine is in the vial, no other. True? We can't betray our parents' trust. St. Kitts and Nevis has always had an impressive humanization history. But these diseases aren't around now. Yes. Our borders are open to all kinds of diseases that negatively affect our children and elders. I never thought about that. Today, you have a choice whether you get vaccinated. So, you want to continue? Yes, doctor. I want to be protected. Check your doctor or the Ministry of Health to get the information on immunization against childhood diseases, including HPV and polio and COVID-19 vaccine for elderly persons and persons living with non-communicable diseases. Pleasant good night again. And if you're just joining us, um, welcome to HealthWise by the St. Kitts Nevis Medical and Dental Association. Tonight, we are discussing the contribution of Taiwan to the public health system in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, we have here tonight with us um, the Ambassador Michael Lin from the Republic of China, Taiwan. We also have William Chen, who is the project manager. We had with us um, Sister Keisha Wallins, the CEO of Care Nursing Agency, who would have benefited greatly from the program as it relates to chronic metabolic diseases. And we are now joined by Dr. Jazel Woland, who would have studied in Taiwan and is now practicing at the Joseph and France Hospital. Dr. Woland, pleasant good night and thank you for being here tonight. As I said earlier, this topic, this health-wise, is not just to discuss trends and patterns of diseases, but is also to showcase and introduce to you the public our new doctors on staff or any allied health workers on staff in our health system. Dr. Wolan is one of our brilliant minds. Um, she looks promising. She's actually rotating on the surgical unit right now. And I must say she jumped at the opportunity to share her experience with us tonight uh, um, that she had in Taiwan. 
So, Dr. Wolan, good night, and please, you know, walk us through your experience in Taiwan briefly. Okay, good evening, everyone. Dr. Wuli, thank you for inviting me here. One, as you said, I'm Dr. Jazza Roland, and I first heard of the Taiwan Scholarship in 2017. My friend and colleague, Dr. Javin Blanchard, shared the information to me, and we applied, we got through. We, it's a four-year degree program, and we graduated in 2021. And now, when traveling to Taiwan, I cannot say I was really too nervous. It's very far, but I've been away from home before. When we arrived, our program managers met us at the airport. They were very welcoming. They were very inviting. They escorted us back down to the south, where we stayed. That was about three to four hours. I must say, in terms of, you know, you move to a new country, you have to set up, you have to register, get adjusted. And it was a very smooth transition, for me at least, in my opinion. Any questions we had, any concerns, they were very, very eager to help us. We, our first two years were academic years, and the latter two years were in the clinical, so we were in the hospital. And in the first two years, actually we were assigned, each assigned an academic advisor. So basically a, a professor at the school, which was the Isho University. The, they were very, very helpful. They would always check up on us. They would ask us, how are you doing? Are you okay? How are you coping? Because when classes started, it was a very fast-paced program. Um, at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad, where I did my undergrad, I was already used to exams at the end of the semester. But when I got to Taiwan at med school, it was basically exams every two to four, four weeks. And they were very supportive of us. They understood that we were away from our family. And one thing I, another thing I must say is that they were very eager to share Taiwan's culture, to introduce us, to help us to be seasoned. And also, they wanted to know about us. I was in class with other persons from other Caribbean countries, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Haiti, Belize, also um, the Kingdom of Eswatini as a country in Africa. You had Nicaragua, Paraguay, and we, we became one, you know. It was really nice. We were all foreigners, in, and we were all very far from home. And it was a nice adjustment. The lecturers there, they, you, of course, you meet those that were very passionate. They always wanted to know, do you understand us? Our program was in English. And I must say, the scholarship, the Taiwan ICDF scholarship, actually provided a stipend to cover us for medical materials, for example, textbooks. And we all know textbooks are very expensive. The dorms that we stayed were very clean, very put together. And at the end of my second year, we basically now had to transition to the hospital. We had a white coat ceremony. We were provided with our white coat. We were provided with the shoes for the hospital. We were provided with a hospital form. We were provided with a stethoscope. So the basics to get you started. And transition into the clinical setting, we were each also assigned a clinical teacher, so a doctor, who would also help us to readjust. We could ask any other, maybe a resident in training, any other doctor, if we have to go to speak to a patient, they will come with us and they will help with the transition, translation of it. And um, coming on to the ends of the program, it was a little bittersweet because we had to deal with COVID-19, so we did not have our graduation. But still, we had the opportunity of being exposed to a completely different culture. We had the opportunity of a doctor of medicine degree. We made friends who became family, actually. And after Taiwan, when I graduated, in, when I completed my degree in 2021, I then went to St. Lucia for one year to do my medical training at the St. Jude Hospital. And now I'm here. <laughs> at the Joseph and France General Hospital. And as Dr. Willie stated, I'm currently rotating at the surgical department 
overall, I must express my gratitude to Taiwan because I would not have been here had I was I not afforded the opportunity of the scholarship to pursue my degree. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Olin. Well put together, well said. And I can actually, you know, understand you a little more, probably more than most, because I did my training in Cuba. I spent 13 years in Cuba. Um, lucky for you, though, you were trained in English. But when I went to Cuba, that went through the door, and I had to learn Spanish because my training, everything was done in Spanish. But even though you were trained in English, you would still have to interact with the patients, which you said, and the persons on the street. So for me, anybody going off to a foreign country that um, does not speak your native tongue, your mother tongue, and would have been successful, that is a great feat. And I want to congratulate you as well Thank on you. what you have done and just to encourage you to push on. You mentioned the ICDF fund and um, William, so there again, the support, the economic support for those scholarships would have come from that fund, which you would have spoken, spoken um, about earlier. So this ICDF fund is actually working. So how can anyone, even like my association, can we access that fund? Um, let me explain a little bit more on this scholarship. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, the embassy provides two scholarships, two types of scholarship. The one is the ICDF scholarship. Basically, most of this uh, discipline are taught in English. And the other one is the MOFA scholarship. MOFA scholarship is provided by Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mm. But this project, this scholarship, basically you have to spend the first year in learning mandarins. Then you apply to the university. So these two type of scholarship is different. And uh, this year soon we will uh, release the list of the recipients for this year's scholarship. And every year, we normally start from uh, February to uh, March the, to open the applications through the Ministry of Education. So actually, we are inviting all the Kitesian Division students to apply these two uh, scholarships to study in Taiwan. But however, you have to decide which scholarship we would like to uh, apply. Because for the MOFA scholarship, you have to spend the first year in learning mandarins. Then you apply to the university. Most of the discipline subjects were are taught in Mandarin. Mm -hmm. But for ICTF scholarship, uh, all the discipline are, are taught in English. However, they are have a specific uh, assigned project uh, subject discipline, just like uh, uh, horticulture, uh, public health, and the ICT uh, or computer science. But for the MOFA scholarship, you could decide whatever sub, uh, discipline that you would like to apply. So that's the difference between these two uh, scholarships. Okay so, okay, so there are two, the ICDF scholarships and the MOFA scholarships. Yes. Okay, and for the ICDF scholarship, you are taught in English. Yep. And then for the MOFA scholarship, you would have to do Mandarin. First. First. First and year. And you can choose any other... Um, whatever discipline you want to yes, choose. Yes, but first you have to pass oh, okay, yes, the yes. test, <laughs> the Mandarin test. You have to be qualified for the basic Mandarin because all the, t uh, the professor were taught in Mandarin. You mm -hmm. At least you have to get the uh, to capacity to uh, command the language. Otherwise, when you are a customer, you will not you will know, know what the teacher will say and uh, what the uh, interaction with your, t uh, with your teacher and your, your classmates. So you have to spend the first year in learning Mandarin. Is there an age limit? Basically, no, because the more fast class you can apply for the uh, master's degree, you also can apply for a PhD. So actually, there are some, you have some. Uh, Students, Kitesha uh, students now in Taiwan actually they are pursuing their master degree and one or two are actually pursuing their PhD degree. I know that one of the students actually study in uh, Taipei Medical University for the part, uh, global health management. Uh, so he, uh, he or she is now actually in the second years in his PhD uh, program. 
Okay, so Dr. Wolan, have you learned any Mandarin? That's something I would like to learn. That's why I was asking about the age limit to see if I can get over there too. <laughs> so Dr. Wolan, have you learned any Mandarin? But you should have um, while you were there. Um, when we got there, we, there were a few courses we had to do. We also had to pass, we also <laughs> had to pass them. And then they were basically general, just to help us, you know, move around town, survive. Mm. <laughs> and when we got, when we transitioned to the degree, we also had to do medical Mandarin courses. So we, there were times where we had to like role play doctor patient relations. However, I must say, sad to say, I have forgotten. <laughs> I've forgotten most of my Mandarin. I do, however, remember my name. <laughs> the name. Thank God. When you, when you reach there, they actually assign, we assign you a, a, a Mandarin name. So my name was Xia Manlan. And yeah, but the basics when you want to move around to own manners, counting money. You know how to ask how much, but yeah. Okay. Oh, so that's interesting. Um, if we look at slide number 17, um, we have our St. Kitts and Nevis ambassador to Taiwan, um, Donya Francis, yeah. Um, last year, November, yeah, he was inaugurated. And he too would have studied yes. uh, in Taiwan. Actually, he was first received a MOFA scholarship uh, study in uh, Min Chuan University, uh, ICTF uh, scholarship recipient. He studied in mass communication in Min Chuan University. And then he applied to study master degree in global health management in Taipei Medical University. So he uh, actually, um, we are very proud that one of your uh, recipients, our scholarship recipient, actually become the, f uh, the second. This uh, you are ambassador to Taiwan. Oh, okay. okay. So yes. the, he's the first. He's the first, he's the first scholarship recipient to mm. become the ambassador. You are ambassador to Taiwan. So we are very proud of him. Yeah, it's very appropriate too because he would have lived in the system. He under he understands the culture as well. So the transition for him would be a whole lot smoother. Uh, actually, he called Taiwan his home. Yes, he did. I remember. <laughs> I I, I heard that. And actually, he participated in one of our TV stations' uh, a singing competition, okay. and he won the champion. He won the champion. Oh wow! So actually, he was very famous in Taiwan. Okay. And we are very happy. Uh, my minister is uh, very happy to receive him become the first uh, Taiwan scholarship recipient. The first. Uh, to be the ambassador of the Kittisians uh, and ambassador to Taiwan. Okay, so if you look at slide number 15, um, so William, as it relates to this um, in your yeah. kitchen, in your kitchen, um, how is this program going? Is, is, is it still going? Is it it's something ongoing? Yes, it is still something ongoing this year um, before. Uh, in 2021, 2022, that we focus on adults cooking competition. And this year, we kind of focus on the children because when children know how to, uh, how to eat healthy, so it will uh, accompany you to, to, to the, your adulthood. So now, this year, uh, we um, recruiting the, the children to join the competition. And the first game, the first competition will happen on um, 29th of uh, May, it's Week Monday. So we're going to have that uh, competition as sweet and savory. And now we already have our um, contestants and ready to compete. And where will that competition be held? Uh, sweet and savory. Oh, oh sweet and savory. S sweet oh. and savory bistro. Oh, okay, and that's at um, Frigate Bay? Yeah. Frigate Bay. Yes, that's Frigate. At Frigate Bay, mm. and that will be on the 29th of, of May. May. Week Monday. Okay, with mm -hmm. Monday, and there are specific schools involved or specific? No, it's re uh, not really. It's like open to the public, so oh. whoever is interested, you can just uh, send your send your um, like email. Send, send just send send an email to, to Inya Kitchen email address, and the email address that you can find on our Inya Kitchen Facebook page. Okay, that's 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 very good. Because we have to start with our children. We have to start because if we don't start at that level by the time they reach our age, then they would be suffering from the chronic diseases that plague us, which is, you know, which are diabetes, hypertension, renal failure, etc., etc. 
So it is really good that we have focus on the children and have them be involved in preparing healthy meals. And we start at an early age, so it becomes practice, it becomes the norm. And not that when they're older, they have to now change their lifestyle to live healthily. So this is a very good venture, and I must say, you know, kudos. And yeah, I think we need to have, you know, persons know about it, go out and advertise it. So on the 29th, so we can look at it on television, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will be live. Okay, it will be live in your kitchen, I guess, in your kitchen website. Mm -hmm. Facebook page. Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And you can actually view it there. So I'm really impressed with that, especially reaching out to the children because we have to make a change. And sometimes I think in the adults, because I treat adults every day, and it's hard to get adults to comply. It's hard because we are so set in our ways. We have been doing what we have been doing for 25 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. So if we can begin to mold the young minds into the healthy lifestyle, then I think we're going to definitely make a change. We're going to have progress. So on that note, again, we're going to take a short break and we will return. So stick and stay. It's a sore thought. I'll write a prescription and see the nurse regarding the MMR vaccine. I heard on social media that the COVID-19 vaccine came in a container with the MMR label on it. Measles, mums and rubella vaccine is in the vial, no other. True? We can't betray our parents' trust. St. Kitts and Nevis has always had an impressive humanization history. But these diseases aren't around now. Yes. Our borders are open to all kinds of diseases that negatively affect our children and elders. I never thought about that. Today, you have a choice whether you get vaccinated. So, you want to continue? Yes, doctor. I want to be protected. Check your doctor or the Ministry of Health to get the information on immunization against childhood diseases, including HPV and polio and COVID-19 vaccine for elderly persons and persons living with non-communicable diseases. What did you mean earlier about climate change, Mom? Well, when I was your age, I remember beautiful coral reefs and healthy beaches. The summers weren't as hot as they are right now, and the rainy season meant that it only rained when it was supposed to. And then what happened? The weather just started to change and storms got worse, coral reefs started to die because the ocean was getting too warm, and crops started to die because there was not much rain. You know, we realized as adults that we were doing something that was causing this. What were you all doing? Same thing we're doing now, not using clean, renewable energy, chopping down too many trees, and even polluting the air with gases, such as the gases emitted from our cars when we drive around. We need to help before it's too late, Mom. We can't let it get worse. What can I do? We can raise our voices. With 35 million dreams, aspirations, and futures at risk in Cari Forum, we need your voice in our story against climate change. Acknowledge. Commit. Act. This message is brought to you by the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center under the Intra-ACP Global Climate Change Alliance Plus program and is funded by the European Union. Okay, good night and welcome back to HealthWise by the St. Kitts Navy's Medical and Dental Association. And tonight we have discussed so far the contribution of Taiwan to public health in St. Kitts and Nevis. I am joined by the Ambassador Michael Lin to the Embassy of um, China, Taiwan. I'm also joined by William Cheng, Project Manager. We had Dr. Roland who gave her experience in Taiwan. She is a general practitioner who is practicing at the Joseph and Franz Hospital. And we also have with us Sister Keisha Wallins who is CEO of Care Nursing Agency and who is also a recipient of the ICDF fund 
as it relates to her business. Um, we're going to go to the, our last slide, which is number 32. Well, and this is something we want to promote as the Embassy of the Republic of China, Taiwan. That's 32, slide 32, where they're having, oh, they're joining up with SKN Moves on May 20th. And William, I would have you speak about this because I think this falls under your portfolio as it comes, as you are the representative at the Ministry of Health for the ICDF or for the technical mission mm -hmm. here in St. Kitts. So this, uh, I think everybody might heard about SK Move. SK Move is an initiative that educate people that have regular, um, regular physical activity and regular health checkup, and also, um, and one more thing. <laughs> anyway, it's it's, it's education uh, It's kind of healthy uh, initiative, and SK Move usually pop up. Um, will host several um, health work in a year. And this year, because it's a 40th anniversary between the two countries, so uh, especially we, we, arrange, we want to arrange these uh, activities that we can uh, work with Taiwan. And I think our ambassador would introduce this like, on behalf <laughs> of the, the, okay. the work. Okay, so Ambassador Michael, Lin. Yes, this year on the 20th of May that we were uh, coordinating with the Ministry of Health to have the SK move uh, work with Taiwan, health work. And f it was open online, so you could register online and we will provide every participant a t-shirt that we brought in from Taiwan. So everyone who you come to the health work will give you a t-shirt. Also that water and the, some uh, refreshment also will be provided. And please uh, bring your water bottle that we could fill in water uh, to save the one's uh, single-use plastic. So we will not provide drinking water. We will provide drinking waters, but please bring your bottles to fill in before we start. So you can only get that t-shirt if you register, register online, online and participate our health work on the 20th of May. And uh, we start from the Caribbean cinema at 5.30. So everybody is welcome and please register with the uh, um, uh, Ministry of Health. And where does the work end? Uh, That's very important. <laughs> we will go through the uh, first start from Caribbean cinema, then with the uh, South Wales uh, road, then to the airport roundabout with the Wellington Road and we come back with the uh, Cairns Street back to a Car Caribbean cinema. Oh. So we, we come back to where we start. Okay, yeah. But uh, let me advise my diabetic patients, please, I know, some of you may want to do the walk. You need to get your comfort comfortable shoes. Some of you may not be able to do the walk because it's you know, a pretty you know, long walk and I do not want you to go walking and getting blisters. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to participate in the walk, make sure you get your shoes half size up and you don't have to walk all of it, mm -hmm. okay? Because we do not want any problems after. I know some persons say, but Dr. Woodley, it was a healthy walk. That's why I went. But you have to remember, if you are diabetic and you have feet issues, sometimes probably that walk may be a little, you know, too much for you. So, but this is something very good though, and uh, the partnership with SKN Moves, as William has said, they do quite a few activities during the year. So now I see that the technical mission, they have joined up with them to actually carry out this work. And I think we would have done this sometime in the past. This, this is not the first. Yes. Uh, you mean this work with Taiwan. With Taiwan. Well, with Taiwan would be the first oh, one. Oh, okay, it would be the first one. All right. Okay, um, I am looking at the donations. We see quite a few donations, and if we can start with slide 22, just for you to give us an idea of the things that would have been donated to the Ministry of Health, to the health sector. Um, slide 22, we are seeing some ambulances, so I don't know, Ambassador or William, if any one of you to talk, you know, as it relates to these slides. Mm -hmm. Um, these two ambulances was uh, uh, donated to the Ministry of Health, and I believe it was in 20. 
15, and I believe that it's still up and running. And then we, um, during the COVID-19, I think the most important uh, contribution and donation from Taiwan is that we provide, we donate 300,000 masks and uh, ventilators, oxygen concentrators, and uh, the rapid agent, uh, antigen test also personal PPE and the dialysis machines and the water purifying equipment to emit the house in the during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I think that um, the mask is very important during that to prevent the transition of the uh, disease, especially in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Taiwan Although excluded from the WHA, WHO, but however, we try our best to help our allies to combat the diseases uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, you see the donation of the uh, to the Exchange Hospital in uh, Nevis, but also the other uh, donation to the Ministry of to the uh, mask grounds uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic to the. Uh, um, JNF. That, that that time, that's the uh, uh, Mister of Foreign Affairs at the time, uh, uh, Mister Brandy. Yeah. Okay, so we see that the, the nation it goes, you know, across the federation to yes. St. Kitts and to Nevis as well. Slide twenty-five. Um, this was uh, the Global Recycling Day, twenty twenty-three. And I see you there in the photo, Ambassador. Um, you look very happy. <laughs> So what is going on there in this photo? Yes, actually, here. actually, we start the uh, management, Saudi West Management a Recycling Project in 2021. And then we help to uh, establish recycling collection point in across the na nation. And uh, every other uh, Tuesday, we collect the single-use plastic and the metals uh, from the general public. So you could come to our collection point. Then um, we will give you a, you could collect a uh, rewarding point. Then you could get the gift backwards later. So you can collect points, then you get the gift. Mm -hmm. So that would be, uh, you can, that will help us to reduce the uh, garbage that we created every, uh, daily, and that we could also extend the life, life of our landfill here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Otherwise, our landfill will soon be overwhelmed by all the waste that we produce every day. Mm -hmm. And we know that single use plastic is a very serious problem of pollution here in, St. in the region, not only in St. Kitts and Nevis. And by reducing and recycling, it would become a renewable uh, uh, materials. Then you could be reuse it to uh, to become a circular economy, create the circular economies for our uh, people here, and that would be um, a best way to protect the plant that we live here. Is not only in St. Kitts, but also in the region, and also the globe of the plant that we saved our, for our better environment for our gen future generations. Okay, so we are these recycling points, because um, I heard you mention that there are areas where we can go. To you could carry. go to the, uh, every Tuesday, mm -hmm. other every second, the fourth Tuesday, we would be in the uh, roundabout at the airport. Mm -hmm. And the third week there, I think it's the, uh, Berkeley is very close to the uh, opposite to the um, cinema. cinema. Yes, you can see those uh, collection points over there. Okay. Also, on uh, the last Saturday, I think it was a deep bay. So you can log on the um, our website to get the old information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that website would be the. Taiwanese technical mission website so that we can get this information on the Facebook you can you can search recycle project and yes. then you will show that's recycle that's the name yes. of their uh, the the recycle project Saudi West Saudi West management a recycling project mm -hmm. okay which is very important because we have all of these plastics that are you know killing our wildlife yes 
you know, contaminating, you know, the ground. So, and as we have to realize, this is closely linked to health. Yep. Because one of the determinants of health is your physical environment. And yep. this is what we are trying to protect, keep clean, so that we can have long life. So, the two recycling points that I got from you would be the roundabout by the airport. airport. And in front of the cinema. Mm -hmm. And that would be every last Tuesday? Every second and the fourth Tuesday. Every second and fourth Tuesday. And the third Tuesday was uh, the um, Berkeley. Berkeley. Yeah, opposite the uh, cinema. Yeah. Okay, so we can make this, you know, persons who are listening, you can make this a family affair. Get all your recyclables, everyone in the home, get all their recyclables, put them together, make it a date, go out and take these uh, materials there and in that way we are protecting the environment uh, actually uh, now in several uh, primary school they also have the garbage bin been pressed mm -hmm. installed so the school children actually they could do their daily uh, recycling in their primary schools that's so so that's the we have to uh, educate our children from the start in the early age so they could build up this habit of recycling. Then back home, they could teach their parents. Mm -hmm. From there, they could spread, spread over to the whole communities. communities. Yes, yeah, so we could build up this. Because actually, when after all these material collected, we were shipping out to maybe to the United States or the other destination for recycling. Mm -hmm. For actually, this cross, the fire brick, is made by the recycled uh, pet bottle. So it's a uh, cool uh, material, dry, they dry very easily, although you're sweating, but it will dry very quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's a very good material to uh, use a recycling pet bottles mm -hmm. to manufacture the fabric and then become uh, tissues. You can use it. Okay. So this will be a kind of, that's why I saw the circular economies. When you throw it, it's just garbage. It's it damages garbage. the mm -hmm. environment. But however, you recycle, you recycle it, you could reuse it, become a new resources that we can uh, utilize. So you're actually practicing what you are, you are preaching, which is very good. And then if you look at slide 26, this was in collaboration with Solid Waste Management. And this is the recycling, okay, another recycling project where they were cleaning um, the beaches. Um, can you speak to this slide as well? Okay, I think uh, because uh, I'm not the project manager of that project, okay. but mm -hmm. I think the, the so, uh, this uh, solid waste management and recycling project, right, they do a lot, they cooperate with the communities and they do host several uh, beach cleaning uh, activities in different venues. Mm -hmm. And then what I never realized, now with slide 29, this, there's another project, probably you're not in charge of this one either, which is the empowerment of women in Latin America. I mean, I found that very interesting. Uh, basically, we just simply call it the Women Empowerment Project. We provide uh, training workshops for the, uh, for the women. Basically, it's focused on the women, especially to who lost, who get, um, who lost their job, unemployed woman during caused by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So we invite them to join our training courses. We are space some, um, uh, basically start from the beauty and the makeup uh, training courses. Mm -hmm. Because we know that many um, hairstylists here, they are self-educated. So we invite the professionals, teachers, to teach them their new skills and to also help them to start their business. Um, we invite all the tutors and instructors from different ministries, from Inland Revenue, from the Small Business Development Unit, to give them the concept and teach them how to start their own business, mm -hmm. how to register their business mm -hmm. with Inland Revenues or with so how to apply their social securities, um, all this access that provided to, and the information provided to them. So, and uh, after two or three weeks training courses, we will select the best, they will have a pitch mm -hmm. to uh, present their idea of the, uh, to establish their own business. 
we will select the best, the top 10, and to provide them about 3,000 US dollars angel funds to start their own business. So if for that project, we already roll out several training courses, not only uh, across the Federation in St. Peter's Navis. And uh, the uh, feedback and the re response is very overwhelming. When you feel that all the participants, they feel very happy and satisfied for the training courses that we provide. And now there, it will, there actually is now um, a training course is undergoing. And then soon on the 12th, there will be a graduate ceremony soon at the, the Kuna Conference Center. That's the, la the latest training courses for the beautification uh, uh, Chinese. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, that is great. Once we empower women, you know, we are safeguarding, uh, you know, the community, the nation. Women empowerment is super important. As we know, many of our households are headed by women. <laughs> And uh, actually, according to the statistic provided by, by the Gender Affairs Ministry, uh, Ministry of Gender Affairs, 51% of the household in St. Kitts Navis is headed by single mother. So it's very important that we have this uh, woman get trained, start their own business, and then not only provide the um, income to the single mother, to the family, but also speed out, as I just mentioned, you will speed out to the community mm -hmm. and uh, the bring more income for the uh, families that we who are in need. Yeah. Which is so good. So if you want to join this conversation quickly before we close, you can see the numbers at the bottom of your screen. Um, 466-2666 Six six two eight six seven four seven six seven forty seven sixty five and our overseas line one two three nine six four five forty five hundred. So this has been really educational for me. I must admit I have learned a lot. Um, even doing my little research before I came here, I did not realize the extent of the contribution that the Taiwanese mission has had in our federation. Although it started out with agriculture, and we know agriculture is closely related to health. And if we secure, f or if we have food security, then you know that's a nation that is well on its way. So in that form, it actually has boosted the health system as well. And since the mission has now expanded to health, we are gaining tremendously. And Ambassador uh, Michael Lin, I'm so happy, and I am pleased to be here to learn all of this and I hope the persons who are listening will try to access the help that um, has been or will be or is being provided by the technical mission. There's slide 28 that I like. Can I have a look at that? And I don't know if any one of you <laughs> can speak to this slide. I love this slide. <laughs> <laughs> this this is our staff uh, participate in the uh, carnival this year, so you can see that we really uh, go out again with all the um, revelers here in St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, in St. Kitts, and uh, we really enjoy the day out and uh, to uh, mingle with the local peoples and uh, to enjoy the atmosphere of the first carnival since the pandemic. So out again. That was out again. Out yeah, again. Out that again. was out again. Yes. And as I can see, you know, you guys are having fun. Um, they say all work and no play. Yeah. Make Jack and I guess Jane all <laughs> people. So I'm happy to see that you're not only here working, but you're also participating in the culture and having fun. So that was very nice to see. So we're going to take a short break and we're going to get back just to wrap up things. So please stick and stay with us. It's a sore throat. I'll write a prescription and see the nurse regarding the MMR vaccine. I heard on social media that the COVID-19 vaccine 
came in a container with the MMR label on it. Measles, mums and rubella vaccine is in the vial, no other. True? We can't betray our parents' trust. St. Kitts and Nevis has always had an impressive humanization history. But these diseases aren't around now. Yes, our borders are open to all kinds of diseases that negatively affect our children and elders. I never thought about that. Today, you have a choice whether you get vaccinated. So, you want to continue? Yes, doctor. I want to be protected. Check your doctor or the Ministry of Health to get the information on immunization against childhood diseases, including HPV and polio, and COVID-19 vaccine for elderly persons and persons living with non-communicable diseases. It's time that we realize that we must work together to thrive. The as we know it, the sky and below it. Could I never have more wonder, yeah, with life and all you see and the climate's changing But hope is remaining And we can't ignore the future, it depends on you and me One chance, all that we got One voice, together we start Take care, the world where we live Permite a todos vivir Tomamos la oportunidad pa' guarda la humanidad And I must leave no one behind Because we are, because we are And welcome back um, for our last segment of HealthWise by the St. Kitts Nevis Medical and Dental Association. We are now closing out and we were joined tonight by the ambassador from the Republic of China, Taiwan, here in St. Kitts. We were also joined by William Chen, the project manager. We have Sister Keisha Rollins, CEO of Care Nursing Agency and a recipient, a proud recipient of the technical mission of Taiwan here in St. Kitts. And we had with us Dr. Roland, who has left, and she gave her experience of studying medicine in Taiwan, which was very informative, very detailed, and we just understood everything that she went through. And we're going to have our closing remarks by our panelists. And we're going to start with Ambassador Michael Chin just to close off for us tonight. Um, I just want to repeat again that our contribution and donation here in St. Kinsinavi is just a response to our 40 years strong and very friendly friendships that we established 40 years ago. That we are very proud to be your partner in your development of your sustainable small island countries. And we will continue and try our best to help, to assist. And by helping yourself, your country, it also help Taiwan to expand our relations with our allies. So I do hope that, I encourage all the Kitesian division to participate in our a healthy screen here that uh, implemented by William and uh, we also encourage you to participate in our solid waste management and recycling projects that help us to clean up this environment and who have a better future for our genera uh, future generation. Thank you. Thank you Ambassador Michael Lin and then we're going to have William Chen to give us his last words as well. Okay, I think um our ambassador already said the most of the thing I want to say, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank um, uh, Care Nursing Agency because during the during the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, all the um, the whole Ministry of uh, Health is fighting was fighting against COVID nineteen, and the care, nursing care agency just jump jump right on board to, to provide their uh, human resource with this project so we can proceed our health screening. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. 
<laughs> oh my god, that is so nice. So, no, so Blois, I guess on that note, you can wrap up as yes. well. <laughs> I want to thank Taiwanese government ambassador, Mr. Lin, and yourself, Chen. Thank you so much for partnering with St. Kitts, and thank you so much for choosing Care Nursing Agency to help with your project. I want to thank the Ministry of Health as well, and Mrs. Novelia Usu and her team, her amazing team, for all their hard work. I want to thank Care Nursing Agency's team. Thank you guys for jumping in, as William said, to assist so you know you can always call on us. And I just want to thank you, ZIZ and Dr. Woodley, for having us here and for also putting it out there for the public because it's important. And I think collaborations like this are important to let other persons know they can help because some persons don't know that their, their help is needed. So this is a good way to showcase what the Taiwanese government has been offering to us for over 40 years. So we didn't know that until today. Mm -hmm. So we want to thank you guys for getting on board with St. Kitts and Nevis. Thank you so, so much. So on that note, we want to echo again, or our, I would echo again, you know, the many thanks on behalf yes. of the Federation to, you know, the Republic of China, Taiwan, for its long-standing, lovely relationship with St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, we do appreciate all of the gifts and donations and the strategic solutions and the policy-making advice that you would have given to us. As we see, the technical mission is none like other. It has helped the Federation in so many ways that I didn't even imagine. So as I said earlier, this was a learning experience for me as well. So Ambassador Michael Lynn, I thank you so much for being here. I thank you for representing your island so well here in St. Kitts. I thank you for being part of the culture. I thank you for helping us transform our little federation into a healthier federation. And William, you're doing a great job. In fact, I first saw you at Nurse Blois' um, function that she had, and I was wondering you know, who you guys were, what you were doing here. And now I have a full understanding of the scope of the work that you're doing here. And we do appreciate it. Sometimes you work and you do not know you're appreciated. But let me tell you, you are appreciated. You are. And please, you Thank you. when you're walking through the square or anywhere and you see the Taiwanese and care nursing agency or any other organization who wants to be a part of this, stop by, get your pressure checked, get your blood pressure checked, get your waistline measured, because all of these things can help you. And I want to say a big thank you, as usual, to ZIZ for hosting us. We are truly grateful that you do such a great job every time we get here. Make us feel comfortable. In fact, I feel like a worker here, too. <laughs> I think I need to be on the payroll just now. <laughs> and I want to say to my viewing audience, thank you so much for being with us on Monday nights. I know many persons look forward to our health-wise. This was a health-wise with a difference. We have to look at the whole picture. Yes. It's not just patients, providers, but we have the payers and we have the policy makers. And tonight we actually looked at that area. So on that note, I want to say a pleasant good night to everyone. Have a great week. Be safe and do something kind for a neighbor, for a friend. Yes.